Welcome to the first of three of our annual Project Green Forums. Uh, they're held the second Sunday of the months of January, February, and March here at the Iowa City Public Library. My name is Marilyn Gaffey. My partner in crime is Jan Carpenter. <laughs> she and I have uh, gotten some ideas together and hopefully uh, come up with some speakers that would be of interest to us and therefore interest of you, to you. Suggestions are always welcome, so please don't hesitate to tell us if you're somebody you would really like to see. Our program consists of our speaker, then we'll break for refreshments again, question and answer period, and that's what the um, piece of paper and the pencils are, and just give the questions to me, then I'll read them mm -hmm. aloud so everybody knows what the question is, and then Chuck will hopefully answer them correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're happy to share a local businessman and gardener with you. His name is Chuck Porto from Iowa City Landscaping. When I tried to come up with an introduction for him, I did like my sister always does. She says, Google him. Just Google his name. <laughs> <clears throat> and according to the white pages, there is no person in the United States or Canada named Chuck Porto. <laughs> there you go. So I'm not sure who we have There today. might be a Charles. Oh, is that it? Okay. Uh, I also went to Facebook. Checked out your Facebook, uh -oh. yeah. Saw some very nice family pictures. Chuck was raised in West Des Moines. Yep. Correct. And now lives in? West Branch. Okay, I had West Branch slash Iowa City. There was two conflicting information. We, when we moved out to West, we, we still refer to ourselves as Iowa City. Iowa City, okay. Yeah. He's a host of the KXIC Saturday morning program, the Lawn and Garden Show. And is that on every Saturday? Every Saturday at seven o'clock. Okay, that's probably why I haven't seen it. because <laughs> <laughs> or heard it rather. He has co-authored a book called The Best Garden Plants for Iowa and this is for sale, is it at Iowa City Landscaping? I, wherever you buy books. Okay, I know it's on Amazon and I know it's at Barnes & Noble. <clears throat> He's also an Iowa certified nursery professional and since 1990 he served as a retail manager of the Iowa City Landscaping. This business was founded in 1982 by several members of the Dykstra family who felt that they could create a place where you can add beauty and value to your home as well as your life through plants and nature. And for those of you unfamiliar with this business, I can't imagine, everybody here, but it's on the north side of Highway 1, just east of the Super Walmart area. Is that what, is that correct yep. way to yep. say that? Chuck is going to give us information on something old, something new, trees and shrubs, evergreens that you didn't know you needed. And since my husband and I just installed an eight foot fence around our 40 year old property, wow. we are finally giving a different perspective on what we can have in our yard. And so we live in the woods, so it's definitely deer, uh, deer, deer oriented, yes. <laughs> so I'm anxious to hear what he has to say. So I present Chuck Porto. Thank you. <clears throat> Am I, am I live now? Can you hear me? All right. Um, I'm just going to show you a bunch of pictures and talk about plants, and I'm not going to stand up here because I hate doing that. I like to look at my screen. So um, you do have papers to write questions down, I guess. I have a lot of slides, so maybe if you, can, if you have a burning question, I'll try and answer it during the talk, but otherwise um, we can wait till the end. So I, let's see, I have my own, my own introduction. I, I grew up in a garden. Um, I, I guess she said I've been at Iowa City Landscaping for since 1990. Um, I still live in a garden, and I believe firmly in passing it on to the next generation. So uh, there's evidence of me growing up in the garden right there. That's, I don't know if you can tell which one's me there or not, but uh, born to be a media star, I guess, there. Um, and then uh, my mom and a couple of my one older brother, one younger brother with our greenhouse, our newly, that's our brand new greenhouse there, growing plants. We grew about 800 tomato plants. Um, 1,500 peppers. It was a big garden. We sold produce out of our garage, etc. So I literally did grow up in a garden. That was uh, the the two standing there in white T-shirts did the, the lion's share of the work during the during the busy, really busy, big heyday of our garden. So that's me and my brother Peter. And my brother Peter lives in that house right now. So, <clears throat> and uh, there's there's the garden out in West Branch. Um, so I, I'm still living in the garden. Uh, vegetable garden there in the in kind of the middle left, and uh, the, my wife's perennial my wife's perennial garden there in front. Um, so, 
And I, like I said, I believe in passing it on to the next generation. That's my two grandsons there. And through the Project Green partnership with Iowa City Landscaping and the kindergarten tree planting program, I've got to do that with both of them uh, in the last two years. So uh, that's pretty awesome right there. Anyway, <clears throat> the whole point of this, this discussion is to talk about sort of fighting through the, the clutter of uh, all these plant brands we see in the marketplace now, Proven Winners and Easy Elegance Roses and H, all this stuff. And, you know, the people, I, I think what the, what the, these plant brand people have done is just taken, for the most part, existing plants and put them in a pretty pot um, and tell us it's something new and wonderful. And some of them are great plants, some of them aren't. So we're just going to talk about what I think are some of the best plants um, out there and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all of this and I have it organized sort of by botanical name so I apologize for that right away. That's how my brain works. <clears throat> um, start with shrubs uh, and this is not a plant that everybody can grow because it's, it gets to be a rather large plant but if, for those of you that have big yards in deer t country that's right in the middle of deer country on the north side of Iowa City and that's a bottle brush buckeye. Um, great big large shrub, shade tolerant, deer resistant, um, but just, just a great big plant. Uh, that's a picture I actually took in someone's yard on the north side of Iowa City. So one of my favorite plants, and, it, and like I say, it gets fairly large. That's probably pushing six feet high and wide right there, and that was 15 years ago. <clears throat> um, for those of you that don't know about service berry, um, some might put this in the shrub category, some in the tree category. I kind of tend to put it in both. Um, but the service berry are great plants. A lot of them are native to this part of the world. Um, it's one of those, in the, my description I talked about trees and shrubs that provide multi-season interest, uh, wildlife friendly, et cetera, and this one, all of those. Um, spring flowers, white, uh, summer fruit that is, if you, if you don't fight the birds for it in your own yard to eat it, do so because they're delicious. Um, and then some really nice fall color. Uh, and there are varieties and cultivars that get anywhere from six to five to six feet up to you know 25 or 30 feet. Um, you'll see it in multi-stem and single-stem forms. It's just a great plant all around. Uh, aronia or chokeberry. You'll see. Uh, you've heard a lot about this in the you know the superfoods and antioxidants and all that stuff. And you can buy those berries in the store now. I think too. So. Um, but another great multi-season plant. And you know I get a lot of people to come in and look for things like burning bush. Um, and I, and I, you know, I say, how about a burning bush with white flowers and black fruit and fabulous color uh, that'll be pretty in the garden all year long. So that's a, that's a great one. This is black chokeberry. Um, and there are several cultivars that have much bigger fruit, if that's what you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> it's not the first plant the birds eat, but it, they do eat it. Um, and if you freeze the fruit, it gets rid of the bitter taste. And you can throw it in your yogurt and your smoothies. It's a touch. And this is red chokeberry. So another, uh, this one you don't really eat too much, but it's really pretty. Again, white flowers, in this case, red fruit, and um, really nice fall color. You can see the, the fall color starting there and the red fruit on the plant. Um, the, the, the chokeberries, rabbits like them, so you need to uh, take precautions there. But uh, another great plant, in the, anywhere in the two, three, four, five, six foot range, something like that. And the black ones, more than the red ones, will sucker. Uh, a little bit, so you'll get some some spreading that way. But you know, great multi-season plants. Why? <laughs> uh, these are some of the new introductions of barberry, and barberry is one of these plants that some people tell us not to plant it. Um, it's invasive. It, 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 there's some disease problems with. Uh, I can't remember what the disease problems are with, but. Uh, um, it's one of those, they just keep throwing out new colors. And one of the things you'll see, and they try to get us with these new names, they, they name plants after food. <laughs> Which I don't know if you're like me, but that's a, you know, limoncello and, you know, or they give them really, you know, they name them after uh, really attra other attractive things. But uh, this is one of those things where I look at this and I say, I don't know why we needed new barberries. We had the two or three we had that um, most of us don't even like to use. Um, so... You know, you can take that with a grain of salt or for what it's worth, but uh, I think there's a lot of clutter out there in the, in the industry. Just, you know, it's from people trying to sell plants and make money, which is what we're all, uh, <clears throat> we're all trying to do. But uh, these might have cleaner foliage or better color, um, but uh, 
you know, I don't, I don't know, I have a lot of space in my garden for barberry, so. This is another kind of really cool plant. It's a, uh, uh, you'll see it called sweet shrub, Carolina allspice, strawberry shrub, um, calicanthus. The one on the left is sort of the native form. Um, the flowers smell a little bit like rotten fruit sometimes, or really, really ripe fruit. Uh, depending on the plant, they can be really sweet or a little, they'll turn a little bit sometimes. Shade tolerant. Um, the plant on the right is a new cultivar, and this is one of those that I think might be kind of cool, um, called Aphrodite. And that's really kind of, uh, the scale there is about right for the difference in the size between the flowers on the native and the flower on the cultivar. They're really big. They look like a big magnolia flower, probably two inches across. They don't have that sweet smell, um, but a really, really, so this is one of those that I think, we, the, sometimes the improvements actually are improvements, not just, um, a, new, a same plant with a, you know, a, a name of a really good dessert or something like that. <clears throat> this is a plant that you almost ne I almost never saw. We never sold it. Uh, it gets, it's uh, button bush is the common name. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great plant. It's, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, bells and whistles as far as, you know, really pretty flowers or great fall color, but it's a real wildlife friendly plant. It feeds everything from insect or, you know, bees to butterflies to deer. Um, has these really cool, but it gets to be kind of a, a, a rangy plant, and there are some new cultivars out on the market. Um, Sugar Shack, uh, I can't think of the other one, um, but they've, they've compacted the plants down a little bit by selecting smaller, you know, plants that naturally grow smaller. So this is a plant that might fit in, in, in some gardens. I still wouldn't probably use it on the foundation of my house, but certainly backyard. Um, especially if you have a little bit of shade, maybe some moist soil, and uh, like to attract wildlife. That button bush, so. <clears throat> there's, I think there's one on the market called Sputnik, too, which is, you know, those flowers. The old red twig dogwood. Um, you know, hard to improve on something really cool, but red twig dogwoods get a lot of canker. They get really big, and if you don't stay on them, they're really ugly. Um, but some of these new varieties that are a little more compact, like Arctic Fire, which is a proven winter's variety. Um, Arctic Sun is another one that has a, a little sort of uh, more orangey, orangey stems. Uh, and the one on the left is one called Pucker Up. It has this really puckery, leathery um, foliage that you know, might make it a little more resistant to deer, I think. But, uh, um, again, this is a case where they've taken a good, really good plant and, and, you know, again, through through some, from, I don't know whether it's breeding or just selection, uh, there's some really nice new compact varieties. <clears throat> and what's prettier than those red twig dogwoods up against the snow? Dutzia, another sort of one and done kind of plant. They're really pretty in the spring when they, when they bloom. Um, but then can look kind of messy. Uh, the one on the left is called Chardonnay Pearls. Again, these great plant names. Uh, has a little bit of limey foliage and then these just masses of beautiful flowers. Um, and then the one on the right is a, is a new variety. Again, another new proven winter variety that's got pink flowers. So um, my brain has stopped working and I don't remember the name of it, but... Uh, <clears throat> That's another one that's, uh, you know, you get a little more, you know, the pink flowers are great. That foliage color um, extends the season of interest of the Dutzi as well. So um, that's, you know, again, what I try to kind of look for and try to try to steer people to are plants that have uh, multi-season interest. So Deer Villa is a, there's a couple of species of Deer Villa or Bush Honeysuckle is the common name for Deer Villa. Um, we use it a lot in landscaping for like massing on shady hillsides and things like that. It really makes a kind of a pretty um, foundation plant. It stays nice and compact. It has really good fall color. You can see on the left, um, the flowers has these really pretty little yellow flowers. And there's a, a, a variegated variety, which is, uh, um, you know, again, adds to the uh, the interest it brightens up shade with those variega variegated foliage, uh, and it's this is kind of a weird plant. When we, the first year we got these at the garden center, they were green, and I called our sales rep saying, you know, why are these plants green? They're supposed to be, 
variegated. Well, apparently the heat, they respond to heat. So when it's cold, they don't turn variegated. They're just green. So <clears throat> he said, we need some warm weather. That's why they're not green. Anyway, cool splash is what that one's called, cool splash. Uh, euonymus, ugh. Um, <laughs> You know, when we hear the word euonymus, we think of these, uh, you know, the variegated little sprawly, however they decide to grow. I've seen them creeping along the ground. I've seen one, I should have put a picture in here, on the east side of Iowa City that crawls up the gutter to the second story of the house. So they can do anything. Our, our beloved burning bush is in there as well. Um, again, I think I used to, I, I give burning bush, you know, we just use them too much and we shear them into meatballs. And um, it, it really is a plant that has... I guess two seasons of interest, fall and winter with the wing stems are real pretty. Um, the picture on the right is our, our, our native variety of burning bush, um, uh, which we refer to as eastern wahoo. Um, again, small tree, large shrub kind of a thing. Not real readily available in the marketplace, but uh, um, I think you're going to see more of these kind of plants as, as uh, the public uh, sort of drives it through people like me, retailers that then respond to the people that do all the growing plants. If we keep asking for plants, we'll eventually get them. <clears throat> Exocorda or pearl bush is another one of these plants that uh, I never even had even heard of till a couple of years ago. And, and, and if you read about it, it's kind of a sprawly um, sort of single season, these masses of blooms. Um, but this is another one that has been kind of tamed a little bit, uh, and there's some new varieties out there that are really pretty, kind of reminiscent of um, bridal wreath spirea in bloom. Um, but uh, some of these new cultivars, Lotus Moon, uh, The Bride, Blizzard, uh, are a little more compact plants. So just something else to throw into the mix when you're looking for the shrub border or maybe a hedge. Um, or a privacy screen or something like that that's just not the same old thing and we that's um, when we talk about trees we talk you know there's not as many trees available to us as there are shrubs but we really need to worry about diversity um, so I think it's important with everything and this is just another another option to have um, father gilla is a great plant um, in the middle there you see what the it's referred to as bottle brush plant sometimes or just father gilla um, those little sort of honey scented flowers that come out before the leaves in the spring. Um, and then this really interesting sort of witch hazily like foliage. Uh, there's a couple, there's a blue form there on the right called blue shadow, which has real grayish blue leaves. And then the fall color on Father Gilla, I think is probably one of the best there is. It is just really outstanding. And you can see there in that picture on the left, there's everything there from yellow to red to orange to almost purple. And it all happens on the same plant at the same time. It's really quite stunning. <clears throat> Witch hazel. Um, again, kind of a big shrub, small tree kind of a plant. Um, the, the, the native forms, I think, can get probably 15, 20 feet maybe um, if you let them. Um, the, the one in the bottom left there is, I believe, the fall blooming uh, variety, Hamamelis. Virginiana or um, common witch hazel. The one on the far right is a picture of it. That, that, that plant is actually over on East Court Street. That's taken out the window of my car as I <laughs> pulled into the driveway there. <clears throat> um, again, fall. I just saw this fabulous plant with fall color and was like, what is that? I got just pulled over and snapped a photo. Um, there are some varieties of the our, our Native witch hazels that are, they've been selecting for flower color, autumn embers, autumn amethyst, um, not real readily available right now, but uh, I think something to look for when you're looking for a, uh, you know, a, a native, you know, small tree with fall color, I think probably deer resistant, um, and again, multi-season interest. Ah, I forgot about this slide. <clears throat> Hydrangea. I think I have three pages of hydrangeas in my inventory list. Um, with hydrangea, you know, we, we, we've all been growing th something like Annabelle for a long time. It's a great plant. It's hard to beat. It, it blooms in the shade. It, it has winter interest. Uh, um, and then we, there was the old PG hydrangea that we all used to grow. And, and then there was 
uh, Tardiva, which is a, similar to PG, but the later flowering and has the, the, the different, slightly different blooms. And then Endless Summer came around, and then the original, and Blushing Bride, and Twist and Shout, and uh, Bloomstruck is the newest one of these, uh, these mop head hydrangeas, and now there's all these sorts of oak leaf hydrangeas, and uh, cultivars of oak leaf, and there's little lime and limelight and pinky. Oh, uh, uh, what's the? My brain has stopped working. But Annabelle, that has really big flowers and uh, incredible. There you go. And great star and pinky winky and vanilla <laughs> strawberry and you know, my God, do we need more hydrangeas? Um, there we go. There we go. There's more. <laughs> so we've been bombarded with these hydrangeas over the last 10 or 10 years or so. Um, Annabelle is still my number one seller. The old standby, it, it, because again, it, it, it blooms in shade. It doesn't get too big. Uh, the deer tend to stay away from it. Uh, it, it has great winter interest. Uh, you could cut flowers. Um, so when you're looking at hydrangeas, Annabelle, that, that, uh, that uh, what was the big one again? Incredible. Incredible. A jury's still out on that one. Um, the, the blue varieties, uh, the endless summer, or, or as we referred to it, the nursery industry after the first couple of years, endless bummer. Um, <laughs> the new one, Bloomstruck, seems to be a little better, but I'm still holding out judgment on that. Um, any of the of the oak leaves are great if you're if you're if anybody grows oak leaf hydrangea. It's one of those plants that I don't care if it blooms or not because the foliage is fantastic. As far as the uh, um, the panicle type hydrangeas, uh, out of all those, probably, if you look up in a nursery catalog, some of those growers grow 15 or 20 different varieties. Limelight's a winner. Um, little lime is a winner. Um, there's a little, little tiny one called Bobo that seems to just bloom its full head off. That seems to be a winner. Um, there's some that have a little better pink phase, like vanilla strawberry or strawberry sundae, which is a compact version. Um, and they're all just a little bit different. So we've sort of limited ourselves to about 10 of them, <laughs> mainly because people ask for them. But uh, um, this is a one case where it's just gone completely out of control. On the, on the herbaceous side, it's like the coral bells and the purple cone flowers. <clears throat> but hydrangea, no matter what form it is, great plant. They bloom for a long time. Um, it's hard to beat. For around here, I think just stick to the, the Annabelle types and then the panicle types like Limelight um, and the blue ones. Maybe plant a few just to see how they do. Uh, I've never been real happy. Although um, there's a doctor in town that has shown me pictures of his, and they're unbelievable. Um, Nyman. Nyman. Dr. Nyman. Anyway, I don't know if they're like that every year, but he seems to have a magic touch with those. Anybody ever go Japanese caria? Again, it's one of those plants you don't know about. It has these really fabulous bare, smooth green stems in the wintertime. And then these little, there's a, the, the, unfortunately for me, the double flowering one is more common in the trade. I don't like double flowers on things, but uh, um, the single flower, it blooms in very dense shade as well. Um, kind of a sprawly, suckery kind of plant, but. Uh, uh, this sort of, again, something a little different. Spice bush, Lindera, spice bush. Again, a native plant, important for pollinators. I think there's a spice bush swallowtail, that this is the only thing it eats. Um, kind of forsythia-ish in bloom, but these you know, pretty little uh, red, red fruit later on in the summer. Again, a sprawly plant that it doesn't belong up next to your house. Um, but anywhere you would plant a big, a big shrub border in the backyard, you know, buy a spice bush or two, maybe two because I think they're male and female, but unfortunately they're never identified as male and female. <clears throat> Another one that's there's just too many of, and this is a love-hate relationship for me with the, the uh, nine bark. Um, Diablo was the first one that came out, uh, darts gold, center glow. Um, summer wine, 
tiny wine now, little devil. Um, in that lower left corner, you can see the, the weird mildew that they get. Um, nine bark likes some shade. They like some moist soil. Anytime they're in the sun, they're going to suffer, um, especially if it's a dry, hot spice. I, of course, have them planted on the south side of my house because my wife wanted a large plant with red leaves there. <clears throat> but uh, what I do with my nine bark is I cut them to the ground every spring. After about two, two or three years, once the plant gets established, I cut them to the ground every year. They get about six feet tall in a season. Um, that keeps them looking better. They're like kind of like red twig dogwoods, where if you don't thin them regularly, they're going to get out of control. So, um, if you have dog have nine bark and you don't like the way they look, this spring go out and just mow them down, and they'll come back. I've done that three years in a row now. Uh, that guy, the little devil, I kind of like that one because it's small. But uh, they do. They all all will get that mildew, I think. Um, but again, if if you keep them healthy, they won't get that mildew. So that's true with just about everything. There's even a few potentillas coming out on the new on the market this year. And again, this is one of those where I just say why. Um, has anybody ever had a nice looking potentilla in their yard? <laughs> <clears throat> Rhododendrons, we, we, we love them, we want them, we have really hard problems growing them. Uh, even in the, in the nursery, we have a hard time growing them. Um, there's uh, some, some plant breeding people, oops, plant breeding people in Germany that have come out with this, this they put a, a, they've come up with a moisture, clay to soil tolerant rootstock. We've had these for a couple of years, so we'll see how they do. Um, but look for that, if you're in the garden center, look for that Encaro label. And it's all on the big, the big leaf kind. Um, but PJM is, is still a great plant. We still sell tons of those. And, uh, uh, but this is kind of exciting that hopefully that's really going to be something that makes those plants a little easier to grow. Sumac. We see it all over the ditches, everywhere. Um, I'm kind of fond of this uh, species called Rus copalina, or shining sumac. Um, shiny leaves. It has a, a little nicer habit than the, than the um, staghorns and things like that. And again, probably something that should be cut down periodically if you don't want it to get real tall. It will sucker like a madman. Um, but again, multi-season, great wildlife plant. Um, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall, there's certainly a space for it in most people's yards, I would think. <clears throat> Hello. I'm just going to skip that one. Spirea, again, why? Why do we grow so many spirea? Any, could anybody answer that? They're hardy. They're beautiful. There's too many of them. And this is one of those where some of these new varieties coming out, I, I may, might, after a couple of years, might lend myself to some of those because I think they, um, Spirea have, in the nursery trade, have gotten uh, viruses in the older varieties, so they always look kind of weird. Um, but uh, that one on the left, is that's actually in my yard. That's Tor, um, which has the, the, the white flowers in the spring, this sort of bluish green foliage and then this spectacular fall color. And this is another plant that I have been cutting to the ground every spring. Um, a couple years ago, they came out with a yellow foliage form called, uh, um, don't remember. <laughs> My photographic memory isn't doing me much justice these days. <clears throat> um, and then the, the, the sort of like uh, magic carpet is the one that I, another one I have in my garden. Um, which has the, the new growth comes out with this orangey yellow. It has these beautiful pink flowers, uh, some, some of the limey foliage, great fall color. There's just a place for these on, in most foundations. There's not a lot of really compact plants that, that provide that blooming. You know, these will bloom two or three times a year if you cut them back. They get great fall color. You can cut them to the ground in the spring so they don't get very big. Um, they just have a place on the, in the foundation, I think. Um, and so we're never going to get rid of them, but um, 
some of these new varieties actually have improved blooming, improved foliage. Um, so there's there's something to be said there. Uh, Proven Winners has a um, God, my brain is not working today. <clears throat> anyway, look look for some of these newer varieties. I think I think they're 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 going to be good ones. T O R. T O R. Yep. Anybody grow uh, coral berry or snow berry? Uh, this is another plant that there's been these, uh, uh, one of the growers up in Minneapolis, Bailey's, has come out with these uh, um, candy and sweet uh, varieties that are supposed to be more compact. They're shade tolerant. They get a lot of powdery mildew in the nursery. Um, but I, th I think they're kind of cool plants. I think they do much better in the ground than they do in a pot um, in a nursery lot. So... Um, that's, and that's the blooms, or the fruit there, the, not the flowers. That's actually the fruit. So candy and sweet, um, and the white one I think is called galaxy. Those are, and I, I think they're good wildlife plants. They are, they are forms of native plants, so um, that's always a good thing too. <clears throat> viburnum, I can't say enough good things about viburnum. Um, I have like six or seven different kinds in my, in my yard. The fragrant types like Korean spice. Um, are fabulous. The arrow woods with their blue fruit, those fruit disappear as soon as they ripen in my yard, they're gone. Um, so I know the birds and other things are eating them. Um, so those are great with the arrow woods, the, the fragrant types. Um, two of those pictures are from my yard. That's, uh, this is, where's my pointer? Um, viburnum dilatatum or, or, or linden viburnum. Cardinal candy, and you can see the birds aren't eating that as fast as they could. And then this is um, black haw viburnum, a great native form. It actually gets fairly large, um, but you know, white fruit, black fr or white flowers, black fruit, fabulous fall color. Um, and another plant that there's just scads of anymore is, is uh, Wygelia, and there are good ones and there are bad ones. You know, again, you know, one of the good old varieties that still sells really well and is a great plant is Red Prince. Um, the, the, there's like 10 of them that have the word wine in the, in the name, and I can't remember. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really crappy. Um, but Wine and Roses is a good one. Um, I've, I've developed a soft spot for, for this guy here, um, and now his name has just escaped me again. My Monet. And not because of the flowers. I just like I like the foliage. Um, and then there's a well, there's one called My Monet Sunset, another newer one that looks kind of like this, but this is actually Shining Sensation, um, or Rain. I'm sorry, Rainbow Sensation. They almost look identical. Rainbow Sensation seems to be a better plant than My Monet Sunset. So um, again, you know, this this foliage is just I'm kind of drawn to that for some reason. It's a small little plant. It does get pink flowers. Um, but the reason I like that one is for the foliage. I'm not a fan of white gilia in general. Um, that was one of the many things that when we moved out to West Branch got thrown into the compost bin. My neighbors drove up and said, what are you doing? And I'm like, you want them, you can have them. I have a big yard for the first time in my life. I'm going to plant what I want. <laughs> so white gilia was not one of them. But uh, very popular plants, and they, they do seem to have a place in the garden. All right. Trees. We, uh, um, you know, with emerald ash borer and all the other problems, with, with shade trees, it's, again, real important that we plant different things. And, and Mr. Vitosh over there against the wall will, will vouch for me when there's, there are too many maples out there. We know there's too many ash. Um, you know, maple, ash, flowering crabs. Um, Honey locust, you know, to some degree, even oaks. I, I you know, I guess may, I would say that maybe we need to, you know, oaks are great, but if we just plant all oaks again, we're going to have a lot of problems. Um, so we're going to mix it up. Um, I do have some maples in here, mostly ornamental, smaller ornamental maples. We all love when we go to the garden center, go to somebody's yard, and they have that beautiful little Japanese maple that dies every other year. Um, <laughs> Get away in your minds, I've gotten away from it, get away from your minds that you need to have red foliage. 
Um, this is a, a full moon maple, another Japanese variety um, that has this beautiful cut leaf foliage that has this unbelievable fall color and it doesn't die every other year. But I have a customer over on the west side of town that has one that's probably 20 years old and it's just as beautiful today as it was 10 years ago. Um, so this is a, this is, it's Acer japonicum, which is full moon maple. This one's called Aconita folium. You don't need to remember all this stuff. Um, but great, great plants. Um, this again is in my yard. Um, one of the nurseries we buy a lot of our Japanese maples from has been working on crossing the, the Acer palmatum, or what we refer to as Japanese maples, with Korean maple, which is supposedly a little bit hardier, but still has great fall color. Um, and they sent me this plant, lovingly referred to as number 23, um, to test in my yard. And I planted this tree last November after it sat on our nursery lot for three months and then laid and got blown over on the ground at my house for another three months um, before I finally had the space available to plant it. I had to move a crab apple. Um, so that's this spring. Not a dead tip on that plant after being planted very late, and then it was a very cold winter, and that's this fall. And that tree gets, that corner faces northeast, so it almost never sees the sun until late, and late, late in the day. Um, but the fact that it survived winter time with, after being planted really, really late says something about the hardiness of these. They're calling it the Jack Frost series, and you will start to see these on the market. We've had a few of them in the last couple of years, so. Um, if you're looking for a pretty, and there will be some red leaf forms. They have to test them and make sure they're hardy. It's a cross between Acer palmatum, Japanese maple, and um, Korean maple. This, this one is called number 23 <laughs> because it hasn't been released yet. Um, this is north wind, another one of these. And what they do is they cross these, they cross these trees and then they just throw like a, a million seeds on the ground and they get... They get, the one I have in my yard has sort of a semi-weeping habit with lacy leaf green leaves. Some of them look like that. They, they look like everything, like both parents and everything in between. Yellow leaves, red leaves, weeping, upright. Um, this is called Northwind, and the, the salesman for this company lives up in Makokoda in a valley where it gets, he says when it's 10 degrees in Makokoda, it's zero at his house. And this is a variety called Northwind. Um, it's one of these hybrids. And this one is available in limited numbers now. So green, red leaves in the spring, green in the summer. Wow, fall color in the fall. And that has survived, I think, four or five winters now in Makokoda, including the winter of 2012. Some of the other ma uh, maples that are, are of note, um, that one on the top left is State Street. It's, a, it's an Asian form of maple that just has beautiful green leaves and real nice fall color. Um, so if you if you if you really need a maple shade tree in your yard, um, maybe maybe one. Um, the lower left is just one of the sugar maples. I think this is fall fiesta, and um, most of the maples you see as you drive around Iowa City in the fall are increasingly. Um, if I had to, um, just because. And then the one on the right is a uh, another sort of medium sized tree called three-flowered maple or Acer triflorum. Um, and that again is, uh, that's, in, that's in my yard. This tree I brought home in like 2005. It sat in a pot on the ground on Court Street for two years, winter, spring, summer, fall. Another year in West Branch on the ground. And then I planted it and I've moved it since. This is a tough little tree. <laughs> and now it sits out there and gets wind whipped. And uh, so again, Acer triflorum. It's beautiful, got beautiful bark. Um, it has really nice fall color and sort of a fuzzy uh, trifoliate leaf in the growing season. So, um, okay, that's enough about maples. <clears throat> Horse chestnut or buckeye. Um, Underplanted, I think, underutilized. We had some, a couple of years ago, just on a whim, I ordered some yellow buckeye, which I believe is one of the native forms. Um, and we were shocked to see, I didn't know anything about the tree. I just thought I'm gonna order these. Um, great fall color. Um, it doesn't get the leaf blight that the, some of the other horse chestnuts and buckeyes do. Um, 
And it's, it's a big tree. It's a big it's a shade tree. It is going to get buckeyes, so some people don't want fruit in their yard, but uh, big yard, backyard. So don't put this in the front yard in your condo, but put it in the backyard in your, in your acreage. Um, you know, these big, beautiful flowers and really nice fall color. And there are some other hybrids. I think the one in the lower right is one called Autumn Splendor. Um, that might be the flowers for Autumn Splendor there as well. But uh, the picture on the left is a yellow buckeye. So again, this is uh, another one of these shade trees we need to probably start using a little bit more of. Um, black alder. Anybody live over in, uh, what do they call it, Bel Air area, Rochester Court? If you go down Rochester Court all the way to the end, um, not the house right on the end on the right, but the one right next to that, in the backyard is about a 50-foot black alder that's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. <clears throat> and there are some other alders out there available in the market now, too. And these are just going to you know, be tough trees, I think, um, that don't have a lot of bells and whistles, but they're, other than the fact that there's something different. You know, great glossy foliage. I think fast growth is what a lot of people are looking for. Um, I think alders, will, black alder in particular, will take some water maybe. Um, but the cool little flowers, the male and female flowers, uh, really cool. Birch. Um, this is a variety called Little King or Fox Valley, which is a dwarf form. So if you, if you like that fall or that winter silhouette of that plant, of birch, river birch, the really cool bark, um, dwarf meaning it's not going to get to be 100 feet tall. It'll maybe get to be 15 or 20. Um, so don't plant three of them right next to your patio with something in between them, like I did, <laughs> that I now have to move. Um, but uh, a great little plant. Uh, and it does everything the river birch does except get really, really big really fast. Um, Carpinus, hornbeam. I am a hornbeam fanatic for some reason. I don't know why. Um, there's a native form um, that's native to this part of the world. Um, and there's, this is a tree that they're starting to do some selection on um, at the nurseries out west. And this is a, a variety actually called native flame, which is just a selection. Maybe it was developed actually up in Wisconsin, I think, at Johnson Nursery, now that I think about it. Um, but they're selecting for good fall color, because that's what everybody wants, good fall color. And that's what, um, so this is native flame hornbeam. Um, hornbeams are going to be 20, 30, 35, 40 feet maybe. Beautiful smooth bark uh, and just a, just a really nice tree. Um, you know, flowers and fruit there on the hornbeam as well. <clears throat> And that's, uh, this is a, a variety that I'm, another, another plant I'm upset, this is a hornbeam as well, that, that one on the right is my backyard. Um, this was planted as about, it was about, in 2008, it was about this tall when I planted it. So it's been through three of the wettest springs on record in Iowa, one of the coldest winters, and one of the worst droughts. And it, it's a Korean hornbeam. And I'm actually going to, I can't find them anywhere. I have one nursery I get, we get them from, and nobody grows it. Nobody, if you, if you look them up on the internet, all you see is bon, bonsai plants. So I'm, I'm actually going to do some, I'm going to take some cuttings off of the, this tree and send them out to Oregon uh, in a couple of weeks so they can start propagating them. And I think this is, this is a variety that's um, a, a specimen that seems to have this just natural, nice little round. Who wouldn't want that in their yard? It gets fall color. It has these beautiful glossy leaves, um, and it's pretty 12 months out of the year. Hickories, you know, we see them all over the place in dwindling numbers, but they're starting to work their way into the nursery trade because they're notoriously hard to propagate. They don't, they don't container grow very well. They don't like to be dug and moved, um, but there are some people around that have figured out how to grow them now. Um, so you're going to start seeing these more readily available, and I think you should start, we should start planting more of them. Um, Shag bark, uh, I'm going to ask you, Mark, which ones do the best? Shag bark. Shag bark? Yeah. But uh, I, I think now that they've sort of figured out how to grow them, we can start planting some more of these as, as they, they've been eliminated with all of the development we've been doing. 
Um, hackberry, again, the, probably the least sexy tree you're ever going to see. It, it's sort of homely, um, but very hardy, uh, great for urban conditions, and it's, whoops, got this fabulous bark. Uh, it's one of those trees you'd never, you, you can always recognize it. Um, anybody have a Katsura tree in their yard? Hey, how do you like it? Yeah, Katsura tree is one that's not very well known. They're, they're in, the, in the, the few that we've sold over the years and planted, they seem to be really, they're one of the thirstiest trees on the nursery lot there is, for one thing. Um, but uh, they have this fabulous bark. They have this um, red bud-like leaf. They can get this really pretty apricot color. There's a couple of weeping forms. Um, the coolest thing I think about them is, is the smell that comes off them. It's one of those plants that releases this smell. If you, if you go up and take a handful of leaves, you can't smell it. But on a calm day when there's a little humidity in the air and you walk by, you're like, it smells like cotton candy or burnt sugar, depending on the weather and the tree. Uh, so I like those little sort of little bonus features of plants. Uh, there was a spectacular specimen at Heard Gardens Nursery in, in Des Moines. Uh, I think it's still there, but the nursery has since moved and been sold. But uh, yellow wood, uh, yellow wood uh, cladas, cladrastis, um, again, a, a native to this, I think the, maybe it's south and east of here. Um, but there's a couple of good examples of them. I, I know of one on campus, on university campus, uh, I think maybe over by the dental building somewhere. Um, <clears throat> again, a tree that does not, one of the problems with yellow wood is it's really ugly when they're little, so they don't look, and people, you take people over and show them the yellow wood, it's like, why would I want that in my yard? Um, kind of like Kentucky coffee tree, they just look really homely when they're small, but uh, they turn into fabulous plants. Um, Dogwood, we all know about flowering dogwoods that we can grow around here. This is Cornelian cherry dogwood. At the Forsythia time, um, you might get this red fruit that ripens really late and is very, very tart. Um, this is a plant that's over in the, the Eastern Europe and Western Asia is a staple food. Um, it's grown for its fruit and they're if you go to like some of the specialty nurseries on the internet, you know, you can buy some of the ones that have been bred for big fruit um, and plant these. Uh, but that, that tree there is in my old yard over on Court Street. Uh, just a beautiful, naturally beautiful tight shape. I think that's Golden Glory is the variety name, but uh, uh, wonderful plants. Corliss. Tur this is Turkish filbert. Kind of looks like a little leaf linden maybe and it's small. Um, another really tough rugged plant I think that's uh, just another option. And again if you go into most nurseries you're probably not going to find them but uh, um, just another, another, another option that you might want give to give a try. Uh, we all know about purple smoke bush or purple smoke tree. This is American smoke tree, native to not quite Iowa, but maybe Missouri, Arkansas, um, southern Illinois. Um, doesn't have those really red, pretty red leaves of the, of the, of the European variety, and the flowers aren't as spectacular, um, but that's a, that's a really, really, really pretty fall color. That, that tree is placed so that when my wife wakes up in the morning and rolls up the window shades, she can see that down in the corner of the backyard. And she, and she loves it. So when I brought it home, she was like, what is this plant? But now, now it's one of her favorites. So, And again, very hard to find. I don't know. They're, they're hard, they are hard to find. Um, this is a tree I don't know a lot about, but it's a, it's a hardy rubber tree. The only cold hardy tree that actually produces rubber. Um, we, have, we have sold these off and on over the years, but uh, uh, with uh, this sort of yearning for diversity that we have and uh, uh, ash being taken away from us. Uh, we're trying, trying to find trees to, to, to fill that void. About 30 per, 20 percent of our tree inventory up until about 12 years ago was ash. But the big, and 
30% of it was maple. So I've been trying to shrink the maple section a little bit and fill it with some of these other alternatives. So um, I've been told that these are hardy all the way up into the Dakotas, at least South Dakota, um, Minnesota. So just a pretty tree, seems to be trouble free. Um, something to think about. Beach. Um, I know of several really pretty European beach around. That picture on the left is actually taken in Newport, Rhode Island, um, where the you know all those big mansions are along the coast, the breakers and all of that. And they seem to have a be trying to have a contest up there or out there to see who can grow the most and the biggest and the, all the different kinds. So um, there's a red leaf, a couple of red leaf ones there. There's a the, one of the big green weeping ones. European beech are fabulous trees. Um, we have a little trouble with them around here, I think, just because of the soils that they may be a little finicky, but fabulous trouble-free trees. And there are several beautiful specimens around Iowa City. Um, uh, the, the, the bark is, is uh, kind of a distinctive feature of beech trees. I think it looks kind of like an elephant's leg. Um, and then that tree on the lower right is the, our native beech, um, American beech, which Again, I think it's a tree that's been difficult for growers to propagate, but is becoming a little more common in the trade now. Not as adaptable uh, uh, as the European beech to our disturbed soils that we have. Um, and you don't see all these weird, I mean, the European beech, there's uprights, there's weepings, there's skinny, there's red leaf, there's variegated. Um, on the American side, there's American beech. That's it. But. Uh, Beautiful trees, and there, there are several of these around town as well. Um, there's a big one down in, I think, Sunset, was it Sunset Park down in Washington, uh, a really nice one. There's a couple of big ones in the that hillside along Dubuque Street where they're going to be raising the road, so I hope they save those trees along there. <clears throat> um, ginkgo, again, a, 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 a very trouble-free ancient tree, maybe a little big for some yards, but there are some uh, small varieties, and the one on the left is called Jade Butterfly. Um, so you can you can get all the the, the coolness of a ginkgo with that fabulous um, fall foliage drop that is just so unbelievable um, in a in a small package. Kentucky coffee tree. This is another plant that uh, again I mentioned earlier. It's kind of a homely thing when it's little. Um, if you want to see what these look like and see the variation in them. Uh, go to the, uh, the Firefighters Memorial out on First Avenue. That's all Kentucky coffee tree planted along the street there. Um, there are several yeah, you're right. And uh, there's a, you know, that's uh, they're dioecious, which means there's male trees and female trees. And the, ma the female trees get the big giant beans, and um, a lot of people don't like that. There are several new varieties on the market now that are male cultivars. And, and, and selected for shape and the fact that they're males so they don't get the, the fruit. Um, the, the, the most common one we see is one called espresso, like the coffee. But uh, just great trees. Uh, and uh, nothing looks to me as dead as a, as a dormant Kentucky coffee tree. They just don't look like there's any promise of anything coming out of them in the spring, but it always does. Uh, sweet gum, we're maybe kind of on the northern range for sweet gum, but, um, and they do have sort of horrible fruit to deal with, um, but great fall color. There's some really nice skinny forms, um, slender silhouette, emerald sentinel, um, beautiful trees, and, uh, and I think maybe, maybe a little underutilized. Uh, and the, the fruit is a bit of a downside, I think. Uh, I don't know. That's that's always almost sort of a deal breaker for a lot of people. Kind of like Chinese chestnut. That's not on my on my talk here, but uh, you know the American chestnuts kind of disappeared, and there's these really hardy, seem to be indestructible Chinese chestnut. But then people see the fruit, and it's like, nah, no thanks. <clears throat> um, Amermachia, uh, is a tree on the left, a, a, a tough, 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 tough sort of small to medium sized tree. The blooms in the summertime. Anytime you see foliage like that, you can probably guess that the tree is a legume, which means it manufactures its own nitrogen. Um, I've seen a couple of specimens around town that are really nice. Uh, so sort of a somewhere where you might plant a flowering crab um, or flowering pear. You're not going to see any pears in my talk today either. Um, 
Think about a macchia. Not, you know, there's not a whole rows and rows of them at the garden center, but they're, they're there. Um, and there are some new varieties that are, are kind of nice too. Um, the tree on the right is uh, Maclura, which is also known as Osage Orange or Hedge Apple. <clears throat> um, this is a variety called White Shield, which is thornless and fruitless. <laughs> so, um, and, and when you see these trees, you look at, and they're, they're just beautiful trees. They have these beautiful shiny green leaves. And um, if you can get by the fact that it might, well, the, 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 the fruitless varieties are, one thing, they have flowering crabs on the ground, but they have these giant softball-sized things falling in your yard that most people don't want. But uh, um, this tree seems to have a lot of promise. Uh, pretty tough trees. Tulip tree. Um, that's, I think that's all I need to say. It's, a, it's another, another native to the eastern United States, um, sometimes referred to as tulip poplar. It's not a magnolia. Um, but uh, tulip tree is another very fast growing, um, which I think sometimes maybe could be a liability. Uh, I don't think it necessarily likes to be pruned, so uh, keep that to a minimum. Uh, but it's a, a beautiful tree and a, a great shade tree alternative. Black gum, uh, or Nyssa, or Tupelo. Uh, again, another southeastern United States native, maybe into Missouri, southern Illinois again. Uh, we seem to have pretty good luck with them here. They don't grow terribly fast, um, but they have great fall color. And, and that if, if, if you had to ask me, if you showed me that picture and said, what is that tree, I'd probably say pin oak. Um, it really has sort of a pin oaky look to it, but really tiny, glossy green leaves. And the one on the right is a sort of a compact variety called gumdrop, um, which obviously has a lot of uh, uh, attractive attributes, um, you know, that compact size, that nice little shape. Another, another native tree, the ironwood or hop hornbeam. Uh, again, you know, not, not a lot of sexiness about this plant. It doesn't have great fall color, um, but it's a tough plant. They grow relatively quickly in youth. Um, just another, another tree to put in the yard, you know. And it does have that, you know, hop hornbeam because of the, those hop-like fruit they get on them. There are a lot of oaks, and I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we probably maybe, maybe plant too many oaks. I don't know if, we, if, if there is such a thing, but, uh, um, and people always say, I don't want, I don't want something that grows a little faster than an oak. Well, there are some, uh, this is one called, um, not Regal Prince, Heritage, which is a hybrid. Um, I think between swamp white and an English oak. And a lot of times when you have hybrids, they grow fast. And this is one of those cases where um, it grows a little faster than, than most oaks do. It has beautiful glossy foliage. Um, yellow fall color probably at best, but uh, um, there's enough oaks out, oaks out there, I think, that we need to keep planting them. And I think there's one probably for everybody. I don't really have a favorite. I like shingle oak, I guess, is one that's one of my favorites. But uh, um, just another another part of our our diversity there. <clears throat> and and elms are back. So for all of us that remember Dutch elm disease wiping out all the elm trees on all the streets, <laughs> pretty much everywhere. Um, there's a lot of American elms that survived that they're that they're propagating now. So uh, Princeton is one, New Harmony. Uh, there's, there's a ton of them. And then there's a lot of hybrid elms, either hybrids between Asian elms and American elms or different types of Asian elms um, that have that same look. They're Dutch elm disease, disease resistant. Um, so we're, we're starting to, this is actually one of the hardest trees for me now to get and keep in stock um, because I think, I don't know, it's, it's people being reminiscent of, uh, of you know, the earlier part of the 20th century when there were so many. Um, but uh, again, we don't want to line our streets with them again, but something to plant. And then Zelkova, which originally I think was brought over here and, and sold as an elm alternative. Um, I think we're probably on the northern edge of the range for Zelkova. 
Um, they're used as a street tree in a lot of places. I don't know that we can use them as a street tree around here, um, but certainly uh, in, in your backyard would make a nice. Um, and Zelkovas are nice. They get, most of them get pretty nice, really dark purple fall color, which is a good thing for those of us. So for those of you that like fall color. <clears throat> And just want to talk a little bit about conifers. Um, there are, whoops. How did that get there? Anyway, um, you know, we drive around trying to see a lot of blue spruce. You see a lot of spru blue spruce with problems. Um, those, those few wet years we had uh, brought, brought to the forefront the fact that there's, there's some problems with a lot of conifers, blue spruce, scotch pine, um, some of the non-native forms. But uh, again, so I think we need to mix it up a little bit. And some of my favorite spruce, the one on the left is Serbian spruce. Um, and the Serbian spruce, is, is, is its characteristics are this kind of nice narrow form, those sort of upturned branches, and then that uh, with that upturning of the branches, you expose the underside of the needle, which is sort of a grayish blue. The top is dark green, so you get sort of a multicolored affair. Um, the tree in the middle and on the right is uh, uh, weeping white spruce. So if you want a nice tall conifer that has the footprint of a lawnmower, um, that, that's the one you want there. And the tree on the right is, is, is in my yard. That's my weeping white spruce there. And you can see I planted it too close to the little miniature birches that are getting way too big. So something's got to go there. But uh, um, that's just like kind of the exclamation point in your landscape right there. Um, as far as pines go, uh, Swiss stone pine is one that's becoming very popular. It's kind of a not a dwarf, I mean, there are dwarf forms. It's a, a very slow growing plant. Uh, <clears throat> the one in the middle there is a plant that got stuck in the ground as about a two foot tall tree at our nursery, the garden center, about 20 years ago or more. And it's probably maybe close to 20 feet tall now, but it's just this perfect pyramid. Um, and, um, the winter, the polar vortex winter from two years ago when the white pines turned brown and the, uh, almost all of the conifers had some sort of winter damage. The Swiss stone pines had no winter damage. But it's not going to be 30 feet tall in, in, in 10 years. It's, it's, they're very slow growing, but they're just a beautiful little perfect Christmas tree shape. Um, I think the one on the left is one called Algonquin Pillar. Um, so there are some cultivars out there now, but... Uh, um, so that little specimen evergreen that you want to put Christmas tree lights on, this is a good one. Uh, and the one on the right is Japanese white pine, um, which sounds exotic, but it's, again, tough as nails, um, or seems to be. And there's lots of really cool cultivars of that as well. <clears throat> um, Bosnian pine, so native to the Balkan states. Um, the one on the left is one called um, Indigo Eyes because of its beautiful purple cones. And they, but they all have those really cool cones like that. Um, one in the middle, I think, is just called Compact Gem. Again, these are sort of intermediate, what I would classify as maybe intermediate to large trees. Um, they stay nice and compact. They hold their shape. Uh, and the plant on the right is a, a, a mugo pine, actually, so not the little mugo pine that we <laughs> plant next to the steps. This is a big one. Um, called Tannenbaum because of the, you know, those, the, the new growth on it. It really looks like candles on an old Christmas tree. And um, Arborvitae, well, you know, you drive around town and you see either emerald green Arborvitae that flop in the middle and get brown seemingly for no reason, or Technies, which are the ones, the dark green ones we have the nice little chubby hedges out of. Um, this is a plant, this is one called wintergreen. Um, which is skinny like the emeralds and dark green like the technies. And um, I don't know why everybody doesn't plant this one. I can, I can put ten, 10 of each of this and the emerald next to each other at the garden center, and the emeralds will sell out three times before anybody buys one of these. I don't know why. Um, 
The one, the one on the right is, again, that's in my yard. And those, tr those were planted in the spring of 2012, and they were about this tall. You can't tell from this picture, but that plant right there is 10 feet tall and just beautiful. Yes? The deer eat these? Arborvita, deer like arborvita, so you got to watch out. But uh, and so I don't know. The, the the nursery people tell me this might have a little bit of western red cedar in it. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, um, but just a fabulous plant. Um, and the ones on the left are actually uh, is a picture of one of my salesmen sent to me. Is somebody someplace over in Illinois? Um, I'm not sure where. But yeah, that's that's actually that's my yard right there. That's my shadow taking the picture. <clears throat> Hemlock, um, big hemlocks get to be very large plants, um, somewhat shade tolerant. Um, there are a lot of cool dwarf and compact forms and weeping forms. So there's and and colored foliage forms. Um, so when we start talking about adding winter interest and multi-season interest, that that foliage color is a great thing. And in the evergreens, that foliage lasts year round. So those the that you know that yellow yellow tint, the white tint. Um, whatever uh, adds interest year round, and then junipers. Um, you know, junipers get kind of a bad rap for just being sort of horrible plants. I think the the biggest problem is, you know, in the '60s and '70s, we we planted them as foundation plants, and they don't belong there. They need to get big, and they need to spread and, and show their natural form, not be you know, cut off at the sidewalk and sheared underneath the windows and things like that. Junipers don't like to be trimmed. Um, the one on the right is a, is a cultivar of the native red cedar um, called Taylor. So again, tall, skinny, rugged. This seems to be a real winner. We have some we planted at the garden center four or five years ago is about four foot tall and they're now pushing 10 or 12 feet uh, and they're just beautiful. Um, the one on the left is a, is a is a low-growing form, and that's again, that's if you if you didn't recognize my little maple tree there, number 23, but that's called lime glow, and that's a, a horizontal juniper that gets the fabulous yellow color, and in the wintertime it turns sort of orangey purple on top of the yellow, which is again just spectacular. So, and, and as far as conifers go, there's just a, an infinite number of dwarf and compact forms. So um, what used to be kind of exotic plants, I have another talk I do that's just all just conifers. Um, but, you know, when I started in this business 25 years ago, you know, we sold about, we sold very few. They were very expensive. Um, and now the conifer section at the garden center is one of our biggest sellers. And so these plants that used to be for collectors are now for all of us. Um, and they, they're sized, um, a lot of them are sized to fit in our foundation plantings and things like that, or in, in with our, our perennial gardens and whatnot. So um, don't forget about these guys when you're looking for plants with multi-season interest and, and uh, you know, wildlife as well. Birds love evergreens. I always tell people when they ask me, what, you know, how do I get birds into my yard? You know, just plant stuff for the, the one thing, but uh, evergreen trees and shrubs will get them there just about as fast as anything. So, but. thank you. We're going to break for some refreshments. So help yourself. If you have any questions, please bring them up here, and we'll ask Chuck after about ten minutes for break. We're going to do some drawings for door prizes, but we're going to answer the questions first. Some of them are quite long. <laughs> questions? Yep. All right. So question number one here. I must have planted at least five native Nyssa sylvatica, black gum, tupelo, in my yard over the years with no luck getting them to survive transplanting. Last spring, I found a cultivar for Moistside Gardens and planted it in my yard, and it took. Moistside discontinued it. Suggestions for getting, finding a nisso which will transplant and grow in part shade. Um, without tooting my own horn, we have four, or four different varieties down at the garden center, so. Um, that's where I would look first. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, black gums, I think, you know, very slow growing, and I don't know how you're transplanting them. If they were bare root, that might be difficult growing them from bare root. Um, just maybe try a small container grown one or bald and burlap one, or, or we got some last year that were root bag grown, which are um, transplant really well that way too. So I guess that's what I'd try, finding one a little bit bigger. <clears throat> All right. If you cut back tor spirea in spring, spring will it bloom? Yes. Um, I've, like I say, I've cut mine back the last two or three years, and they still flower. They do tend to bloom on the older growth, but uh, they they did flower, um, you know, June, mid June, I think. So uh, most of those uh, small spirea will bloom readily, even if cut back. Uh, recommendation for a small foundation shrub in intense hot sun late morning through afternoon. So um, small, I take to mean something spirea or barberry size, which are two things that would probably work. Um, you know, people are always worried about growing stuff in shade, and, you know, intense sun is a really tough place to grow things as well, especially if it's kind of a hot spot. Um, and I think that's why, you know, some of those things that we tend to turn our noses up to, like spirea and barberry, um, come in real handy. Um, those are the two things that come to mind real readily. I'm kind of mentally looking at my shrub area and trying to figure out which, um, I would say catoniaster, but I think if it's real hot, um, those might have a little trouble. Um, Maybe some of the small evergreens, um, if you were looking for one of the little dwarf spruces or something like that, might be a good spot for something like that as well. <laughs> when is a good time to prune a cotoneaster, or should it even be pruned? Um, I think plants like that, which um, cotoneasters aren't necessarily grown for any particular season, be it blooms or fruit or anything. Um, I, I always like to prune things that I'm not worried about early spring blooming on in the spring prior to growth um, or midsummer, um, depending on when it blooms or whether I'm worried about bloom or not. So early spring would be sort of the default time uh, for something like Catoniaster, April-ish, something like that. I, walking around earlier, somebody said something about, um, asked me when I was talking about pruning my nine barks to the ground, shouldn't, I do, shouldn't you do that in the fall? Um, I personally think in most cases for shrubs uh, that you're growing in your yard or in foundation that you should put your pruners away about the 1st of August and don't touch them again until late March. Um, when I see people out cutting back plants in September and October, you know, shearing their boxwoods and their spirea, it just turns my skin because uh, when you're pruning those things at that point of year, you're stimulating new growth at a time when they should be going to sleep. Um, so, I'm on a personal crusade to end fall landscape pruning. <clears throat> trees are a whole different matter. Do, another question here, do trees need winter protection? Um, from the deer. From the deer, from the, from the uh, snow removal people. <laughs> um, I, I guess maybe somebody, whoever wrote that could clarify. Uh-huh. Not really. I mean, red buds are one of those plants that grow on a really wide range of geography. Um, they're native to from about this area um, down into the southeast United States. So if the trees you were getting came from seed source from Alabama, those trees probably aren't going to winter here very well. Um, the ones we sell are northern source seed. There's one that's got, uh, they refer to as Minnesota strain or just, um, so just northern source seed, even though they're the same plant, uh, there's a term for that. I can't think of what it is. Um, that, you know, they're acclimated to that particular climate. So if they're northern strain, they're going to survive better. Um, you know, there's been a few winters in the last 20 years where one year all of the really older, a lot of old redbuds died, and one year all of the ones that were about this big in diameter died. 
I don't know what the reason for that is, just the oddities of winter. Um, but no, you shouldn't have to protect something like that in the winter to, to get it through the winter. Another question here, what is tree of heaven and how can I get rid of it? It should be called, <laughs> it should be called tree from hell, shouldn't it? <laughs> um, it's just one of those uh, invasive weedy trees that are in a lot of disturbed areas and um, if you're talking about big ones, chainsaw. chainsaw, if you're talking about, you know, small ones coming up and I don't know if they'll come, will they come back from, so if you've got weedy trees or like mulberries or anything that you want to get rid of and you cut them back and they keep coming back, um, you know, I don't use a lot of herbicides in my garden, but um, we have a, 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 bit, a very large perennial garden and we have three, mul four mulberry trees along our back fence. I get mulberry trees everywhere. If you don't pull them when they're this big, you can't pull them. So I wait till they're about this tall, then I go in and I cut them off at the ground with my pruners and I take my little bottle of brush and stump killer and paint it on their full strength and then they don't come back. So, um, and that's a very, for people that don't like to use, you know, chemicals and herbicides, it's a very, um, you're not dumping stuff into the soil or spraying it into the air. You're putting it on the trunk of the tree and that's it. So it doesn't, you're not causing a lot of contamination in that way. So um, that's just a great way to get rid of any kind of weedy trees that you don't want. <clears throat> Two of my favorite trees, Acer truncatum and seven sun tree. Your comments on these. Um, Acer truncatum is, a, a, I think the common name is Shantung maple. It's an it's a Asian species. There's a couple of real common hybrids between uh, truncatum and uh, platinoides, which is the Norway maple um, on the market. I, you know, I think, for, I think they're nice trees. They have really nice fall color. Um, again, I, you know, I'm not going to fill my yard with just those, but uh, I think those are nice trees. And then seven sunflower or heptico heptacodium is the botanical name. Uh, it, it's it's a... Uh, I think it's a great tree. They they seem to be real hardy. They are um, they're kind of weird looking. They're kind of scraggly, I think, in some cases. Um, but uh, and again, it's another one of those trees that blooms in the summertime, which is kind of an odd oddity for flowering trees around here, anyway. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it it's sort of the winter hardy version of. Um, what are those things that grow all over the South in multitudes of colors, and they. Crepe myrtle. It, it, the, the, the bloom is reminiscent of crepe myrtle. The stem is reminiscent of crepe myrtle. Um, but uh, pretty trees. I, 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 I like them. Uh, another question. Green giant arborvitae. Um, we live in, we like, green, green giant arborvitae we like in Coralville. Dill resistant, fast growing, fairly hardy. Any comments? Um, I think that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, Green Giant is, a, is a, a hybrid between Western Red Cedar and one of the other arborvitae species. Um, again, very fast growing. There's a, the, the best example of them I've seen is um, Dr. Kammermeyer's house, which is right across from those, if you're driving east on, west on Highway 6 through Coralville and the, you know, the things that look like Three Mile Island, the cooling towers uh, on the parking lot on the university, look on the other side of the highway he lives at the end of First and Drive, and he's got, he was one of the first people that, I think he, he, he's the one that got me to order them in the, the first time. Um, so he's got some that are 20, 25, 30 feet tall, and they took a hit two winters ago, but they came back. They were almost completely brown in the spring, but they came back. So if you want a very fast growing, um, I would probably like to see them in a, not as a windbreak out in the country, um, but, uh, and they seem to be deer resistant as well. So at least from deer browse, um, you know, antlers are a whole nother deal, as those uh, people know. But uh, it, it's called green giant arborvitae. Yeah. Uh, why isn't my forsythia blooming very much in full sunlight? Um, two possible reasons. One is um, a lot of the varieties of forsythia aren't flower bud hardy this far north. So 
A lot of times you get sort of below the snow line blooming in the spring. And, and if you ever do any printing on it after about July, then you're cutting the flower buds off. So uh, for Scythia, one of those spring blooming, you, you cut it back after flowering like you do with lilacs up until maybe end of June. And then don't prune anymore or you're going to be cutting the blooms off. Um, if you like forsythia, there are some really good flower bud hardy ones available on the market, so maybe it's time to swap it out for a different variety. Any other questions? That's all the ones we have written down, but uh, does anybody else have any other questions that maybe... Yes, sir? A comment on the uh, red bud. I had one twice. I sprayed 2,4-D underneath it. Just talk. I, I spread, sprayed 2,4-D underneath it, and they by, both died. So I don't know whether they're susceptible to 2,4-D or not. Red buds are very susceptible to 2,4-D to and some of the broadleaf herbicides. Yeah. In fact, if you drive through town in the spring, almost everyone you see will have that kind of leaf cupping that they get when they've been sprayed, even though it wasn't anywhere near them. So if you're spraying under the trees, probably very, very susceptible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the truck. So could I use that on the, uh, my crab apple tree, my flowering crab apple tree? I get all these suckers on that. I have to trim them back a couple times a year. No. no. You don't want, you don't, the question was, can I use the herbicide, the stump killer on the, the suckers on my crab apple? No. You don't want to do that. Um, there is a, I mean, you can continue to cut them back. There is a product um, called Sucker Stopper that you can use, and that, keeps that, those from coming back as much. It's very expensive. A little 12 ounce spray bottle sells for like 35 or $40. Oh, <laughs> but again, it's, you know, how, how, how valuable is your time and how often do you get to do it? So, um, so, so certain things like that I think seem to be worthwhile. Um, the good news is a lot of the new crab apples um, that are entering the market now, they, they've, I don't know what they're doing, whether they're Rooting them, rooting them on their own roots rather than grafting, but they're they're touting them as sprout free. So um, sucker, non-suckering. I think they must be rooting them on their doing them on their own roots or something. So. Okay, great. Thank you.